Okay, thank you very much, Libby. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ian Mean. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm uh, Gloucestershire Director for Business West. Um, title of our uh, webinar today is The Green Agenda. I've been very impressed by what Cotswold District Council have been doing in terms of developing their green economic uh, growth strategy. I actually wrote a column uh, to local papers saying normally these reports are as dull as dishwater. I found this one really illuminating. Uh, so that's the, the basis for it. And uh, I just want to introduce quickly um, our guest today. First of all is Councillor Tony Dale, who's the Cabinet Minister for Economy and Skills. Uh, we then have um, James Milner. Now, James is Managing Director of a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting environmental project called the Wild Carrot at Chavenage. Uh, Catch Energy, uh, we have Ben Gilbert, a director. Uh, and from St. James's Place, obviously one of the biggest companies in the area, we've got Alex Davies. Now, Alex is Head of Social Value. And last but not least, Paul James, Economic Development Lead for Cotswold District Council, who's responsible with Tony for putting together that growth strategy. As Libby has said, uh, I'd like to do questions after each member of the panel has talked briefly. So starting off with Tony. Tony, you've got the aspiration of being the greenest council in the UK. How are you going to do that? Uh, well, right. Well, uh, we tried to lay that out, Ian, in, um, in, the, uh, in the green economic growth agenda. Um, I think, first of all, just just by way of introduction, you know, I, I, I've, I've lived in the Cotswolds for 30 years and, and pretty much born and grew up here. And um, things haven't changed in the Cotswolds for too long. And I have to say that, you know, having spent all of my life in private sector business, the opportunity um, when we were elected in, in May 2019 to really lead the Cotswolds in a different direction was too good to resist, really. Um, as many people on the call will know, uh, Gloucestershire has been experiencing a loss of 18-year-olds of for decades, really. We're, we're an aging county. And that was something very much that the administration at Cotswold District Council wanted to turn around. And then I asked myself as a sort of cabinet member for the economy, what did that really mean? Well business has to help us lead that and the way that business can do that and turn on young people is to talk about the planet about environmental security about green energy and about having a social conscience so uh, these are more latterly the trends of esg you know environmental social and governance issues which have not really figured high on corporate agendas for for many many years what have we actually done? Um, well, that's that's really about building back better in the Cotswolds. So uh, I set about uh, re really actually recruiting and bringing on board uh, an economic development officer, Paul James, and uh, you'll have a chance to dive into the detail on the economic growth strategy with him later on this morning. I just want to give you a few headlines before he does that. And, and that's primarily around saying, what does green economic growth mean for the Cotswolds? More than anything, it's about really delivering great careers, great jobs, great opportunity in future facing businesses for the Cotswolds. Businesses that can sustain themselves over the next 20 years, add things back to the planet rather than take away and create brilliant careers for young people coming out of our schools and colleges. Um, what are we actually doing? Far better than me talking about lovely platitudes for political direction. Uh, we've created the Green Economic Growth Strategy and that's been voted through council, all members. And so that is now our policy. It's embedded in everything we do. Uh, in the council meeting prior to that, uh, we actually set up the Recovery Investment Fund to help businesses use green economic growth as their way to bounce back 
out of lockdown and I hope many businesses will take that opportunity. What is it all about? Uh, we are promoting as a district council uh, some key industries, in particular, anything that's based digitally, obviously, because of the huge growth in online and e-commerce business during the lockdown. In particular, many of you will know we have a, a cyber tech hub in Cheltenham, and that now extends to many, many second tier cyber technology businesses across the Cotswolds. It's pretty geographically agnostic, and we do have a lot of cyber tech supporting businesses in the Cotswolds that help places not just like GCHQ, but all big global corporates in sustaining their cyber security. As you all know, we have an agritech uh, strand, which is uh, led out of the RAU, but uh, the world of farming and farm and food security will change dramatically over the next 10 years. And so we want to be a part of the economy supporting that development and to see businesses in agritech growing in the Cotswolds. And uh, finally, it's really all about how do we help green environmental sciences grow dramatically over the next 10 years as well. So anything which enables us to do great business, but adds back to the planet or is zero carbon, then we will support and encourage that type of growth. Why is that good? Well, it, first of all, it obviously encourages businesses to be future proofed. Secondly, it's highly appealing to young people. So these are the types of businesses that 18 year olds, 21 year olds will want to be a part of and they will want to have careers in. That is great for the employability of young people in the Cotswolds. And finally, it's where most of our communities want to go. They want to live and work locally. We want to reduce the amount of travel uh, across the Cotswolds so that people can actually work, if not from home, then at least from a, a local growing business. Uh, and we actually want to do something very fundamental to support that. I, I'm not going to say too much more, Ian. I'm sure people may have lots of questions of me and I can't dive into all the detail on a call like this. But uh, just to make a very clear statement at the end politically, because it's not my style as a private sector businessman for 30 odd years to come up with great policies and ideas without any money and resource behind it to deliver on those. Uh, this council, this administration has voted through uh, a recovery investment fund over the next three years of £50 million. That is not an insignificant sum for a council of this size. It is there to support our businesses to invest in green technologies. We will be looking at uh, how those companies wish to do that, what types of capital support they need, and how we can enable them to do that with competitive interest rates. So we should be an opportunity for any smaller business or large business to invest in green economic growth with support from the CDC to actually do that at competitive rates. And we want to help people do that. Our first capital investment board will be next week. So we are right on making this happen now. I'm gonna stop there. I'm sure people have lots of questions. And Paul, uh, the Economic Development Officer, will tell you a lot more about the detail of it uh, later in the morning's proceedings. Uh, there you go, Gideon. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I just want to make the point here. You've got 6,900 businesses, haven't you, in the Cotswolds? Yes, and we have. Telling me that something like 5,200 are actual micro businesses. So they're going to be able to access these funds if they have the right proposition. Absolutely right. And, and in fact, one of my big enthusiasms is I've, I've seen how much particularly the hospitality sector has been hit in the Cotswolds as a result of the pandemic. Anyone in that sector will tell you how tough it's been. But uh, that only constitutes a fraction of those 5,200 businesses. Many of them have carried on working successfully using e-commerce, working from home, working from small offices because we have a digital economy here. Those are the very businesses I want to promote the growth of, uh, to create them uh, organic growth, uh, employing young people, making much more of their ability to sell via e-commerce and online. Absolutely. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, any questions initially for Tony? You can always come back to him later. Okay, let's just move on to our uh, second speaker. Uh, that's uh, James Milner. James is um, 
managing director of an amazing sounding company, The Wild Carrot, uh, at uh, Chavenage. And a lot of you know that area. James, you've got a, a great, great idea um, to improve the environment and let people have fun. Can you, can you tell us about it, how all that works? Yeah, hello. Um, I hope you can hear me, Ian. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so I, I'll just start. How, how long do I have, Ian, just so, so I can I can just... About pick three up. or four minutes. Okay, so Wild Carrot is um, a, a new company based out of Tetbury. We're into sustainable tourism, um, and we do three things. Uh, we, do, we provide glamping, and we build shepherd's huts from sustainable material. Um, we provide a cafe and coffee stop for cyclists, and we do um, green rewilding projects. And so um, the glamping and the cafe profits are all ploughed back into uh, rewilding, and in particular, um, climate change and how we can experiment with making sustainable tourism truly sustainable. Um, and it's it's a very very interesting um, environment to be in, and uh, we've been doing it now for three years on and off, um, and we've been doing it full time since November 2019. And my goodness, we've learned a lot in the last year. I mean, not not only with the pandemic, but in terms of soup to nuts. How can a business be sustainable um, e ecologically, sustainable from a profitability point of view, so that that business can promote um, green ideas and green um, futures and how do we um, educate in particular those um, people we've, we've got a strong belief that those people that are coming to the South Cotswolds in particular um, from London um, can they're on holiday they can absorb ideas and they're in the best place to be absorbing ideas whilst they're on holiday they think can then go back and to London and typically these are people, captains of industry, et cetera. We're, we're very keen on promoting um, five-star hospitality to attract these people, stop them flying to the Maldives, stop them flying to the Caribbean um, and, and get them over to the Cotswolds and do that in a guilt-free, sustainable way. Um, and so that they can go back with their ideas. Now we're not, we're, we are sort of getting ahead of our station here, but we do believe that, you know, Sustainable tourism can sit neatly um, in the Cotswolds um, alongside all the um, beautiful countryside that we've got without impacting it. So we can bring more volume of tourism tourists here, um, but with minimal eco impact. In, in fact, we can um, increase the biodiversity um, by using the money that these tourists are, are providing to us. Um, and that's really what Wildcat's all about. Um, we started as a small um, cycling business um, doing eco tours of the Cotswolds and we've now sort of grown into this, um, as I say, eco sustainable tourism thing. All the time we're learning and um, it's fascinating, it's interesting um, what Councillor Dale was saying about um, employing um, young people in particular and getting them super interested in these ideas. It, it's not difficult. Um, they're all, you know, they've, they've spent the last 20 years growing up in school, learning about eco, it's in their DNA. It's us old people <laughs> with the gray hairs that, um, you know, that, 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 that need to be more education actually. Um, so really it's about giving opportunity and creating the right environment for our children and the next generation to come along and be able to take these ideas and, and build on the foundation and making sure that we do the minimum that we that, that we can to um, upset the planet at the, this point in time until they can take over and sort it all out for us. So, um, oh, sorry, that's probably longer than three or four minutes and uh, I've got many, many more things I can talk about um, if, if required, Ian, but um, that sort of sums up Wild Carrot. Right. Thanks, James. How can uh, Tony and his team at Cotswold District Council help you, do you think, in the future? Um, well, in particular, there's, there's quite a number of things I think that the council can help with, um, and it's not just necessarily funding. Um, so, you know, particular case that we've got a Chavenage, um, 
we're, and we're working across three sites, by the way, Chavenage is what, just one of, of our sites in the Cotswolds. Um, and it, it is to um, diversify the farm, uh, the 2000 acres that Chavenage have to um, allow tourism, um, as, as I say, with a minimal eco footprint, um, being, you know, I'm, I'm really um, infused by the, the, the talk of, uh, you know, relaxing some of the planning laws to allow for this um, and also speeding it up. Um, you know, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of time and effort has to go into um, ticking boxes. And I think, you know, cutting through that red tape, but in obviously without, um, you know, damaging or, or going against the policies that, that the council have got. And, you know, I'm really heartened by um, the, the white papers and, and, and the new um, planning policies in particular. But I think being able to understand how to fast track that. So, um, for example, there, we, we sit on the Macmillan Way. The Macmillan Way is a, is a great resource. Um, we want to see more people on it, um, but there's nowhere for them to park. They, um, you know, they're parking in laybys, they're parking on the roots of old trees and destroying them. Um, it's dangerous, they're getting out their cars with dogs and children. Um, and it's, you know, but having a small car park area that's, that's in the right place for people to access the Macmillan Way, um, which may mean having to um, sacrifice a, a small green field, but it, it's decisions like that, that, um, you know, and I've just plucked that one out as a, as a particular one, because I think it's always useful to have an example. Um, it's, it's things like that that I think the council could really help with and, and just sort of getting on board with um, and, and behind business. And, and, and I'm so heartened by everything that I'm, that I'm seeing. And I'm only just sort of understanding, we feel like we've been doing this on our own for quite a while. Now we're starting to get engaged with the council. It's great to see the support there and to see that we've got like-minded individuals that are, that are there to help us rather than hinder us. Um, I would say that those, those are the key things. James, thanks very much. And you employ quite a few people already, don't you? Yeah, we've got um, about 10 people on the books. We've got about 40 part-time staff as well. Um, so as I say, ranging from carpenters, manufacturing the, the huts, through to cafe staff and hospitality staff, um, right through to um, tour guides for um, electric, electric bike tours. Um, and then also we, we do, um, we work very closely. This is one of the key things actually. Um, for us is, is this sort of local um, community. So, uh, and, I'm, and I don't just mean the local people that live around Tetbury uh, and, the, and the areas, I mean the local community of business, small businesses, and being um, able to do in our, our own small way, provide a sort of hub, a place where, people, where businesses can come, they can talk about these things. We can start using one another's services um, and supporting one another. Uh, not only from an ecological perspective, but just from a general business, um, you know, it is great. So, for example, we use, um, we, we've been working for three years now with Calcott Group of Hotels. Um, they're effectively our marketing arm for, um, you know, for the, the tourists that come. Uh, they provide, uh, we're, we're their sole supplier for electric bike tours. And so our, our customers come through them. So when we didn't have to start from scratch, trying to market, you know, in a, in a very busy marketplace to um, to people in London and, and 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 elsewhere to to talk about the Cotswolds, it's already there, um, and and so using hotels and other businesses that already have that database, um, we found was was invaluable. Um, that's really why we're here. Um, we couldn't have done it without them. Right. Okay, James, it sounds uh, you need have a, an open day and invite us all all down there. We'd love to, yeah. We just all need to get vaccinated first, and then you can all come down and, and we'll, we've got some great stuff that we'd love to talk to everyone about. Th thanks, James. Um, I just want to... Ian, you've gone on mute. Just want to move on now to Ben Gilbert. Ben's uh, director of Catch Energy, and uh, as Tony has said, there's actually a lot of companies in the Cotswolds in this area. Ben, can you um, give us a feel of what you do at Catch Energy and how you feel that that market can be expanded in the Cotswolds? 
Ben, you're on mute, I think. Yeah, so just to give you a little bit of uh, background, we actually um, started off developing our own battery storage technology within, obviously, the renewable industry. Um, over the last probably five to six years, we've been doing quite a lot of work, as well as in the UK, but also internationally, um, uh, in and around renewables. But we very quickly realize that regardless of whether you go to a developed or a developing country, you always seem to have common denominating issues. And that seems to be around agriculture, water, energy, and connectivity. So what we wanted to do was then, as opposed to developing our own battery storage technology, and, and the issue that we had there was that, uh, just being honest, we couldn't keep up with some of the big players. The, the technology changes ever so quickly. And when you're up against organizations such as BYD and Tesla that have obviously got uh, considerably more funding than, than, than what we were ever able to access, what we did then was move more into a consultative approach um, and become solution providers in and around renewables. Um, we do also do quite a bit of work in the agri-tech field. So uh, one of the projects that we had in Sri Lanka was it was there were a tender out for not, not huge, uh, five to 10 megawatts of solar. The issue that they had there was they valued the land too much in terms of agriculture just to give it up for a solar farm. So what we did were we developed a, a system that extended a solar, so a solar frame, um, worked with a company out of Dubai called Al Madden that's got a transparent solar module. So then all of a sudden you can develop 100% power using solar, but then you can also use the land underneath to be able to grow, uh, which was just one scenario. We then developed um, our own hydroponic system with alongside Plymouth University, which now allows us to have a completely off-grid growing facility. So if we wanted to grow strawberries in the middle of the Sahara Desert, that would be possible now uh, with the products that we've got. Going back to renewables and being a solution provider, I guess there's not really a, 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 one, uh, a one product fits all for, for every type of scenario. Um, so we do work with different battery manufacturers. We'll always provide the best one that fits the, per, the, the, the that's right for the job. Um, we do quite a bit of work in and around solar carports. We obviously do solar. Um, so we're quite uh, agnostic into our approach and, and we like to work with organizations, our council, our organi uh, uh, governments, whatever it might be, to really help them in their goals in, in, in becoming a lot more green. Ben, can you give me a feel of uh, the opportunities there are in your business, your growing business? We're in the year of COP26. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're hearing lots and lots about uh, the need, the Sunday papers yesterday talking about the need to develop battery factories. Here in the Cotswolds, what are the opportunities for companies like yours? Well, there's, there's obviously a great opportunity. I know there's access to a lot of funding that's available there and then. I think the, the thing that we really need to do is is find more organizations to work alongside that are happy to work in, in the same sort of industry as us. So if, if a company wants to be a little bit more, go, either go green or if people want to save money on, on, uh, on, the, on their energy bills by, by also switching to solar, that is something that we can also assist with. So it's not just the technology and the experience that we can bring as well. We can also bring... Um, funding towards projects if somebody wants a, a, a power purchase agreement or something like that we can actually get that done for local businesses also what about uh, retrofitting of homes that's going to be big on the agenda isn't it yeah absolutely and um, there's some really smart technology uh, that we've got access to at this moment in time where um, you don't necessarily have to have solar in you can just have batteries um, and the technology in it allows it allows the homeowner to uh, trade with the grid. So it's built up of quite a lot of uh, clever algorithms and it learns your, uh, your, your energy habits. So it knows when people come home, it knows when they use the majority of their power. 
if there if it's got this technology installed what it can do is it can share it with other people that are in the community so you're actually creating more of an off-grid uh community than just developing solar for your own individual property storing it in a battery and keeping it within that own individual house is that something you could share with the council and develop as a partner perhaps absolutely yes that sound, sounds a great idea. And you work all over the country, don't you? Yes, that's correct. Uh, give us an idea of the sort of projects that you 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 look at and are yeah. looking at. Yes, yeah, so we're we're currently doing um, we're we're one of the biggest installers of EV chargers up in and around um, Scotland at this moment in time in more remote areas. Um, we we tend to go to some of the places where most organizations don't want to go. So uh, we're fully committed. And I know there's a lot of noise in and around EV charging at this moment in time. Uh, with regards to renewable energy, we've just done uh, quite a large project uh, with an organization up in, up in the Northeast. Um, we've done quite a lot of projects in and around Yorkshire. Yeah, you can probably tell from my accent that that's where I'm from. Um, but we, we literally go anywhere in the country. Great. Well, don't worry about the accent. I'm sure uh, the Cotswolds will have an effect after a while on you. But that's, <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. Can I just ask uh, Tony? Tony, um, retrofit of homes is going to be a big part of the green agenda, isn't it? Um, I think I think it's two aspects here, and I think retrofit is certainly a big part of the green agenda. We have quite a lot of small and medium businesses in the Cotswolds already doing solar retrofit, and also an increasing number doing uh, ground source and air source heat pumps. Yeah. So, from anyone looking at it from a domestic energy point of view, it's a absolutely viable technology now, and it is supported by government grants. From a, a new bill perspective, this is something that one of my cabinet colleagues, uh, Lisa Spivey uh, on housing and another one, Rachel Coxcoon on climate change. Uh, they're both very keen to see developers come forward and promote and deliver uh, fully zero carbon housing. So that would provide viable low cost housing to run for particularly young people in the Cotswolds. And, you know, we, we're not going to easily retrofit every listed building in the Cotswolds. Um, that's a reality. But for businesses in newer premises or for new businesses being built, we absolutely have the enthusiasm and the appetite to make that uh, a very planet friendly execution, uh, fully behind what Ben's doing here. Great. Um, th thanks very much. Ian, you've gone back on mute again. Just coming to uh, Alex, Alex Davis. Alex has um, got an interesting title, Head of Social Value, Alex, at St yeah. James's Place. Um, I was interested in read your chairman's article in the uh, Sunday Times Business News yesterday. Now, St James's Place is a big, very large wealth management company. Can you um, can you give us a feel, Alex, about the green agenda and how you're approaching it locally? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're a 30 year old business in Sirencester. Um, we've got about 13,000 people nationwide now made up of about three and a half thousand uh, micro businesses and then about so nearly 2,800 on our uh, our employee base. So we're, we're kind of in the public eye, we're a FTSE 100 business. Um, and from our perspective, sort of the environmental and social governance is actually central to what we do. So um, we have a team of about 23 people who are focused on our community engagement and about five people focused purely on uh, responsible investing. So sort of for what, uh, what we're really focused on at the moment is where do we have the biggest impact as a business? So there's probably about three areas on that. One is the impact of advice. So encouraging, uh, it's give or take about 117 billion pounds that uh, our clients invest. How do we support those, educate those people and help them to invest it in places that's low carbon and that is sustainable. Thinking around 
you know, how do we then choose our fund managers? So for example, we've insisted that every fund manager um, to be one of our fund managers, I think we have about 37, 39, uh, they have to be registered with the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. So I think we're the only business that, that insists on that. We've now rejected some businesses who didn't want to meet that criteria. And then thirdly, sort of our, our own business, the actual carbon that we have. And again, there is, it, we're able to just offset so we can, we can pay the fine, but for us, it's much more important to actually just reduce the carbon that we're doing. So I think in the, I've tried to dig up numbers for this. I think since uh, 2015, we've had a 50, 48% reduction and, uh, and a much bigger one if you went from our peak in, in 2017, but this will be the fourth year in a row that we've had a, a, an actual drop in carbon use despite um, almost doubling in size over those five years. So it, it, that's kind of our three, three stage approach, but very much it's at, at this scale, we're now trying, how do we try and set the example? How do we make all those three and a half thousand businesses responsible in, in their own right? So we've used something called the Good Business Charter, uh, which is a, a relatively entry level kind of um, standard, which any business can do. And we've helped pilot them to go, it was, it was 10 people plus size business, it's now um, sole trader plus scale. And one of the principles in there is there's 10 principles. One is around environment. So we, we help all our businesses to look at this um, and, and helping them to measure their carbon, to understand where their carbon is and their energy uses and how to drop that. So whether that's trying to provide um, sort of green emissions uh, uh, deal. Um, so they uh, to encourage all those businesses to actually buy their energy from fully renewables. So it's again, trying to find this, the scales. Um, the other thing we're actually doing, I'm interviewing this afternoon for a new head of environment. So again, as a business, we're really focusing on this. It's, you know, at the moment, it's a side of about five people's desks, but we want somebody to come in and make it uh, their core role and put it on the side of absolutely everybody's desk. So it's, it's that kind of putting it right at the heart of the business. I, I think from our perspective, we know that we invest in businesses that are good on environment, that are good on sustainability. They tend to make more money. So it makes more sense for us to be one of those businesses as well. Um, and we can't put those criteria on the supply chain that we have. I think we spend about 430 million pounds a year on our supply chain. We can't insist on those suppliers to behave in certain ways if we're not doing it ourselves. So as one sort of the, near the top of that, that supply chain, it's, it's incumbent upon us to set an example. And that, that's sort of the kind of territory we at the moment. And obviously doing things like signing up to um, 2050 carbon neutral, seeing how we could do that faster listening to 1.5 um, degrees, five-year actual targets, so that it's not just saying this is what we're doing over a 20-year period, but this is what we're doing this year and over the next five years. So we're, we're, we're very good actually in this space, um, but we wanted to make a little, little bit more of a USP from our perspective. I think being based out in Cotswolds, not in the centre of London, gives us quite a different perspective uh, on, on what it means to be a big business in the UK at the moment, and also gives us that sense of stepping back and really understanding the impact of it. So Alex, if I'm one of uh, your clients and I'm running a, a smallish business, what's this the sort of advice you give to me about the whole area of uh, net zero and environment? I mean, a lot of it is actually, first of all, understand what you're doing and just sit down and, and measure what it is you're, you're burning um, energy on and burning carbon on. And, and it's, it's, you know, going from the building you're now in, I think a lot of us at the moment got conversations around, well, it's all very well us pushing our employees. I'm obviously working from home in Sarancester right now. So uh, the business's carbon footprint had a, had a big drop, but my personal ones sort of shot up this year. So it's trying to understand exactly what is your personal carbon footprint and then the businesses map band together as a, as a, as a, as a, as a business. So you, you, you combine those and then just start looking for the biggest impact to reduce it. You know, some really quick wins like buying renewable uh, energy moving to, to zoom meetings rather than driving but it is thinking creatively about that and just getting help i think one of the things that what we say to our businesses is there's there's a lot of really really smart people in this space who have done a lot of thinking on it google talk to them get into these kind of meetings and find out what else what other people have already done you don't need to reinvent the wheel it, it, it's out there so a lot of it is for our point of view is trying to make it really easy for those businesses here are some solutions we've come up with creating a network for people to share ideas, because obviously a lot of those businesses are, are in similar scales. Some of them might be 200, 300 people, some of them will only be one person. So it's trying to get the networks together to really share the ideas and share the learning to make it easy. I think it, you know, with, with the year that everybody's had and the year we may still um, have, it, it's trying to allow people the space and, and often the mental space to put this further up the agenda. And again, make the business case. A lot of 
a lot of what we do is say this isn't we used to talk this is about doing the right thing it's about it's about the ethics of business now most of it is much more around this is actually just good business you reduce your costs you'll be more efficient as a business you'll uh, be more attractive in terms of your brand to your clients and you'll do the right thing so it's, it's much more of a business centric message that that tends to land a lot better uh, in this environment Alex, do you think that uh, a lot of big businesses like yours are placing greenness as high up the scale as you are? Out of one to ten, where do you put the environment and green perception? I mean, if we talk, if we talk from our perspective quickly, we've got six core objectives. Responsible business is one of those, and environment is, is the core of that. So, you know, it's absolutely central to our strategy, and it's, it's core to our our brand message, you know, SJP has never really put itself out there. We now have to, we now are, we want to, and, and being a responsible business is, is absolutely is, is core to that. I think if you look at sort of responsible business theory and, and what's happening, a lot of businesses, um, of large tech businesses, I won't name any, um, have, have really focused on customer service at the expense of, of anything else. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how we operate as long as our customer service is outstanding. The ethics doesn't matter. The responsibility doesn't matter. And we're seeing that that increasingly just isn't washing anymore. Any, any large business is now being dragged uh, into this. And it, it's really essential that you're on the front foot. You don't want the brand to look like you, you, you know, if it is about who you are as a business, how you want to behave, you need to be on the front foot because every business is getting dragged into this. I was talking to some friends in, in, in the sector yesterday, specifically on environment for this. Uh, and I think a lot of them are saying large businesses are, are, are now... ESG is not going away. There was a sense maybe two, three years ago that, okay, maybe this is the fad, maybe this is the latest thing and it will pass and something else will come along. No, the zeitgeist now is this is here to stay. And that uh, value led business is, uh, and purpose led business is what business is going to be about. And if you don't get ahead of that, you won't connect with customers because other, other businesses will just simply do it and they'll do it much better. And you know, if, if anybody on here if you haven't looked up B Corp, I'd strongly recommend. Uh, I mean, Good Business Charter is really good as an entry level sort of standard and a way to recognize your credentials as a business. Um, UN Global Compact is another one that's relatively easy, and that's the, the United Nations. It's the biggest global one. If you want to excel in this area, and which is where we're talking to some of our businesses, B Corp is, is really the standard to go for. It's a really good one. It's a lot of support to get, to get that standard. But that was specifically designed in America to support small businesses to disrupt mar large marketplaces and give small businesses a way to disrupt big businesses because they can be more agile, they can readjust their brand much stronger. So if, if anyone in this call isn't aware of that, go and look at it because it's a really powerful way for, for industries to, to change and to really talk very strongly to clients. Alex, that's uh, absolutely excellent. I just want to call on one of my colleagues now, uh, Nina Skubula. Uh, business West. Now, Nina has been uh, helping us uh, pilot zero carbon. Nina, can you give, uh, that was a really good summation, I thought, by Alex of uh, the commercial proposition. Can you just sort of give people an inkling of what we're trying to do? Yeah, sure. So um, just before the new year at Business West, we did publish our climate statement. So I think anyone going into this sort of field, it's really important to demonstrate your credibility. Um, and in that, we, we outlined that we have an ambition to reach net zero by 2013. And we're developing an action plan to do that. And at the same time, um, as we're doing that, we are actually offsetting our carbon and also doing a little bit more as well covering all of our employees emissions but we are aligning our carbon reduction to science-based targets um, at the same time we just realized that you know part of our scope three emissions it is about the impact we can have with our members and the wider business community so we are creating a, a an online business hub which will come online in the next few days um, the phase one is just going to be um, resources available, signposting to some of those schemes that Alex has just mentioned. But it'll be a really good opportunity for lots of the speakers today to sort of, and others, to add, um, to put up their case studies and talk a bit about how they're taking that approach and what benefits they're seeing. Because I think it's so much more valuable hearing from Alex and Ben and James about what they're doing and what works. 
and it has such a big impact. Businesses listen to other businesses. Um, so that's that's being rolled out. The other side of things is it's we're looking at is um, sort of our policy and influence. So um, obviously Ian is based up in up here in Gloucestershire, so he's got really good relationships um, with the councils there. And I see my colleague Dave is on there from Swindon, and I'm based down in Bristol. So with you know we've got really strong relationships with the local authorities and the combined authorities. That means that we can really play quite an important role bridging that gap between business and the um and decision makers and sort of making that case because a little bit you know there's ways that we can sort of unlock um opportunities then to reach net zero so i hope that's a, a little quick overview for you there ian yeah thanks uh, very much nina uh tony you've got um something like a sort of four pillar green approach haven't you uh, so it's it's not mine. I make I'm, I lay no claim to it, but I found it incredibly helpful little uh, mnemonic for any business, small or large, in terms of just making the first steps. I mean, one thing we've heard from Alex is that St James's Place is way way ahead of the game, and he is absolutely spot on in identifying that this is about reputation management. It will become so critical for all businesses to be able to demonstrate their environmental and social credibility over the next 10 years so we've all got to pay attention to this and uh one thing that i found which was highlighted by my my you know climate change uh cabinet colleague is these four pillars and it's really simple the first pillar is think about your own carbon emissions think about your own business think about how you utilize the planet's resources what are the actions that you can take within your control to actually reduce your energy consumption reduce your carbon emissions, reduce the amount you travel pointlessly, add value back to the way that you run your business. So perhaps you source your materials in a better way or you reduce the travel associated with uh, supplying things. So that's that's pillar one. Pillar two is pretty straightforward as well. It's saying, look, if we can meet these requirements, so can all our suppliers. So Alex talked about his supply chain being over 400 million. If you can have a direct impact on your supply chain, however small it is, by saying, look, if we can be green, so can you, then that's pillar number two. It's encouraging the people that supply you to be green as well. And then pillar number three is a kind of obvious next step as well, which is saying, well, actually, if we can get our suppliers to, to, to be green, then actually we could start creating all of the products and services that we sell to be inherently environmentally friendly. So everything we do has to actually add back to the planet, not subtract from it. In other words, today, if I'm if put in simple terms, if I actually sell, um, I have no idea, ink cartridges, let's take a really basic one. If my ink cartridges today are made out of plastic, what can I actually do to make them out of something that's recyclable or renewable or in some way avoids us having to use plastic in those ink cartridges. There's something I can do in design and product manufacture. So that's pillar three, a lot harder, more investment long term, but brilliant in terms of adding to your reputational credibility. And then uh, point four is actually the obvious thing is by then you're now encouraging your very customers to be green as well. So everything you sell, everything you say, everything you do is engaging with your customer base to make their actions in engaging with your business really environmentally friendly and positive as well. Really simple approach, easy for everyone to remember. If I can remember it, I'm sure anyone can. But it just makes some practical steps. Not every business who, that operates out of those 5,200 in the Cotswolds is going to be whizzing off and achieving B Corp standard. But some really simple steps to reduce their carbon emissions, use green energy, actually think more about the biodiversity the ecological aspects of what they do all absolutely fantastic it will encourage consumers to come to their door i'm quite sure of it Ian. thanks tony alex do you think uh, the cotswold district council are on the right track here what more do they need to do i mean this is a big subject isn't it and it's a subject a lot of firms might talk about in the boardroom but do they actually do anything about it? Yeah, I was just going to pick up 
two points very quickly, uh, Tony raised there just to re-emphasize them. One is on, on the supply chain. Um, you know, if, if you've ever anyone's done any work with Sky, for example, they insist that their entire supply chain from top to bottom must be plastic free. So that's just an example. If you, if you find yourself talking to any large businesses, they're increasingly doing that. Or you know, I saw at the last week, Marmite said that you've got to be real living wage. So, you know, this kind of pressure is going to build in, in large supply chains and that will get knocked on. So being ahead of the curve there is actually about business protection and business risk. And the other side you, you mentioned there about environmentally friendly products, I'd say, you know, we've offset for, for years and years it's now this is it's much more about what is the impact of your product and that is how we are measured so when when we're measured by FTSE for good and, and the, the compulsory ESG metrics that look at us we now get zero points for the charity work we do I think 10 years ago that's where you got almost all your points from now it's, it's all about your product that that is the start and end of it there's no point you can't pay the fine or offset it's that that's the sense of it and again small businesses much more able to adapt to that kind of pressure than than larger businesses coming back to i think on, on the council it's it's just talking to us because i think a lot of a lot of it is and i talk more from an sjp perspective very briefly here is for us to trying to understand what is the pressures that the council are trying to address and how they overlap with us so you know transport is a really big one for us you know, how do we, we don't need people traveling so far to get to our business and, and COVID has really given impetus to that. How do we maintain that? So connectivity is absolutely essential. I think, um, I know I've talked to a couple of other businesses that are looking to work with councils to work, look at incentive schemes for employees. And so, for example, if would a business match fund loft insulation or cavity wall insulation, for example, with a council, with a government, et cetera, because if your carbon footprint is going to be measured in where your employees are now working, them being in a, in a, a, a listed Cotswold building suddenly really matters. So how do you reduce their carbon footprint at home? And I think sort of thirdly is, is that innovation is looking forward. Uh, any business at this scale, we, we have to put in clear five year um, activity plans. And again, doing that in isolation simply doesn't work. It, we need to engage with um, local councils and, and, uh, and county councils to understand well, how what are they operating how can we sort of take advantage and work together because otherwise we're acting in isolation and we won't see the impact that we need to see and again that then rolls through our supply chain you know, there's, there's a lot of um uh, sort of pressure from those those environmental social governance um matrix and, and, and uh, benchmarks which require us actually to try and reduce the carbon footprint of our supply chain and buying locally is a really key element of that so again, I think, you, I think you'll see more of that from larger businesses because there are pressure. If anyone's not aware, ESG score, there are things like FTSE for Good, MSCI, Sustainalytics, and they're, they're external benchmarking organisations that measure businesses of a certain scale, whether they want to be measured or not, and then they publish the results. And then investors use that to decide if you're worth investing in. So it really, really matters for businesses that are publicly listed. And some of the tick boxes is it's about minimum standards rather than best standards. Some of those tick boxes, for example, are saying, are you employing people locally? Are you training people locally? Are you buying locally? How are you supporting local businesses? So that, that is something that's, that's emerging out of these, um, these scorings and the, these organizations. And then the large businesses have to respond to that. If they want their scores to be high, they want to encourage people to invest in them, they need to demonstrate that they're taking the, these sort of actions. So hence talking a little bit about supply chain, understanding what is it large businesses are, are having to, to enact and see, because that will filter down um, supply chains to, to every single level. But again, it's something that small business can filter sort of upwards to wave the flag a bit and say, look, we're, we're outstanding at this we'd be a great case study in your annual report. We'd be a great case study to come and talk to your employees. You know, there's a lot of, lot of two-way power here, um, which, which hasn't really been in place before. Just on that two-way power, Alex, so you think that where you are as a major employer uh, in the area that you could work well with Cotswold District? Yeah, absolutely. We, we can't operate um, in silo. It's just simply not possible. And I think a lot about trying to bring in a specialist role here is to enable that. What we've realized is that it, what was a, a kind of a mission that people, individuals like to do, and we had our champions around the buildings, it's now moving away from that much more into well, what, is your, what is your core business strategy for your area of the business? What are your environmental targets? How are they competing? How are they then linking into the overall business? So we have to look at it from a business perspective because we need to invest funds into the most impactful area actually then that that joined up approach we do in the business we need to do externally into our supply chain and into 
um, local government around us as well. So it, it's, it's, it's just not possible to do it in isolation. We've seen that internally in the business and we reflect that sort of externally as well. Thanks, Alex. Um, just one other question for you. Um, uh, you're interviewing for a new head of environment, you were saying this afternoon. Yeah. What sort of person is that? What are you looking for? Well, uh, we, we advertised uh, back in November. We had 78 applications. It's one of the highest um, applications we've ever had for a job. I will say that there was a, a wide way, range of wages from about 30,000 to 150,000 pounds requested, which uh, is an interesting kind of reflection on, on uh, just the scale of what's happening in, the, in this sector at the moment. What we're looking for, for us, it's someone who's fantastic at communication. It's someone who'd be really good at bringing together areas of the business. Frankly, it will be a way of actually of talking to people who aren't yet convinced in this. Um, some parts of the business, it, it isn't top of their agenda. Now we need to make it top of their agenda. So there's a bit about negotiation in there. And then also it's about going out and simply bringing most, most areas of the business together. This isn't someone who's gonna do the work. This is someone who's gonna coordinate and inform and educate and, and coordinate um, the activities because again as i said before uh, as tony said it's about your core product you, you need to ensure your core product is is environmentally sustainable and then work that through your business not not the other way around so i think we're kind of, where we are we're beyond sort of cost savings and into fairly large projects so we've got a, a new project that kicked off um first of january which was how could we as a business go completely paperless and uh, we, we moved to online signatures so we, we use a, 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 a docusign basically means you as a as a there's lots of forms you have to sign last year we had 56,000 that were signed online well that's 56,000 letters that didn't have to be posted so again we're now looking that through the business how can we could we just print nothing is that possible you know apart from one copy of the annual report could we do anything more than that so there's some practical steps we can do but most of it is now upwards into core business operations into the core product okay thanks Alex very interesting um I want to ask Paul James if he can have a chat to us. Paul is the uh, economic development lead for Cotswold. Um, I've known Paul for a long time. He used to be a leader of Gloucester City Council. And I would hazard to say, Tony, you've got a very good person here. And looking at the uh, strategy, it's obvious he's been involved in that. So, Paul, you've got a few slides, haven't you, you're going to show us? I, I do. Thank, thanks, Ian. If uh, if Libby can get those up on the uh, the screen, there, it is literally only a few, so so it won't be the uh, infamous uh, death by PowerPoint. And and we have covered uh, a lot of the of the grounds that I've set out in in these slides. But so I'll, I'll take you through it fairly quickly. But um, I joined Cotswold District back in uh, July of 2020, and the administration's priorities were were very clear about uh, wanting to grow the local economy in a very active way and support business, but to do so uh, in a, a green, environmentally friendly uh, manner, having declared both a, a climate and an ecological emergency. And as, as has been mentioned, one of the first actions I was tasked with was to work with Tony and others to put together this green economic growth strategy, which uh, I don't see as an end in itself. Uh, but it's something for us to, to work to. And of course, delivery is the most important thing. And we adopted uh, that strategy uh, in December of, uh, of last year. But before uh, we can look too much to, to the future, what we've had to do as a priority, of course, is to help our local businesses through these tough times we're in at the moment. And, uh, and colleagues in the council have worked to pay out literally tens of millions of pounds uh, in government grants to, to, to well over uh, a thousand businesses. But moving forward, we want to grace some of the, the key sectors, so building on the strengths the area has, and we've heard quite a lot about this already this morning. So Agritech, um, building on that link with the Royal Agricultural University, helping our farmers to become more productive in an environmentally friendly way, uh, attracting more of those types of, uh, of businesses and, and growing them in the area with the, uh, the Farm 491 uh, innovation hub at the RAE, which I see as just being the start of that. Uh, cyber and digital, we've heard about uh, Cheltenham taking a big lead because of its link with GCHQ on cyber, but there is uh, enough to uh, to go around the whole county. And we've got some great 
uh, digital businesses already in the in the Cotswold districts, and we're we're having some very uh, exciting uh, conversations about some potential projects already in the uh, the district. And of course, we've heard a lot about this morning about green technologies, whether that's uh, renewable energy or uh, retrofit of of energy saving uh, measures or uh, electrical vehicle charging points that we know we need, need a, a lot more of. Uh, and then there are other sectors like uh, medical equipment. We've got some great businesses like Corin Medical, uh, in Siren Sester, uh, Insight Medical in Tetbury, Summit Medical in uh, Borton on the Water. Uh, but we're not limited to, uh, to, to these sectors. We need to be flexible and take advantage of whatever opportunities uh, come along. And we need to look after the businesses we've got right from uh, SJP is our, our biggest business right down to uh, all of those thousands of micro businesses that, that we mentioned. Uh, Tony mentioned about the recovery investment strategy, which is about the, the council directly investing in the local economy. And this isn't about buying shopping centres or office blocks elsewhere in the country like uh, some councils have done. It's about uh, putting the infrastructure in place so, so businesses can succeed. And, and contributing to tackling climate change at the same time as, uh, as earning a return for the, the council taxpayer as well. So if we can move on uh, to the next slide. So we, we've heard a lot about um, the, the move to, uh, to digital and how businesses must be digital savvy now to be able to uh, succeed and the pandemic has, has hastened uh, that shift. And there are a number of things that we're doing. We're working with the tech company, maybe, to help improve the digital presence uh, and the social media presence as, as well of businesses in the uh, the district across all of our our towns. Uh, but of course, it's not just about retail. Digital is is vital for pretty much uh, any uh, business now. And I'm very excited about the uh, the new Applied Digital Skill Centre that's being built at Sirencester College. It got four and a half million pounds almost. Uh, of government funding through the LEP back in the uh, in the summer, and uh, and it should be open at some point in uh, in 2022. We really want to uh, make the most of that. Uh, in terms of of infrastructure, and I take a broad view of that, uh, particularly in a rural area, having good broadband and mobile phone signals really important for people to be able to uh, to do business. And Cotswold is is the uh, the best digitally connected uh, rural district in the country, so the uh, the figures tell us, but we know that it, the, that good coverage isn't universal and we're pushing the operators really hard to, to fill some of those uh, not spots that can be so, uh, so problematic for, uh, for, for business. Uh, in terms of employment, land, one, obviously one of the things that we've got in the district is lots of, of land, uh, but clearly we need to develop anything sensitively. And we've got some good employment sites coming forward, particularly uh, there's nine hectares of employment land as part of the Steadings development in Sirencester. And part of, of that will come forward as, as an early phase. Uh, we've heard about training and skills this morning, and that's really important now, both in terms of uh, business competitiveness, but also uh, to, to make sure uh, young people are uh, maximizing their employability. And, and the offer I, I've, seen is fairly fragmented uh, and difficult to, to navigate and one of the things that we've been doing is working with the county council and the LEP to put together a skills portal for Gloucestershire which is uh, is now up and running and uh, we, we've heard this morning about uh, en green energy uh, retrofitting and that's another area we've been focusing on because the the lack of uh, qualified and uh, accredited installers has been one of the the limiting factors on that so we want to make sure that uh, local people have the uh, the opportunity uh, to learn those skills and, uh, and and take up jobs in that sector uh, so yeah, if we can just move on to the uh, the, the next or the final slide uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, sustainable tourism and in the wild carrot we've got a great example of that and our colleagues in uh, in Cotswold tourism uh, have been working to spread out the tourism across the whole of the, the district. So rather than it being concentrated in the honey pots like Borton on the Water uh, and Bybury. And there are areas like Sirencester itself or the, the Cotswold Water Park where uh, I think you can, can reasonably grow 
uh, that tourism without having any any negative impact. And we want to convert the the day trippers where possible to to overnight stays, and to promote bookable products uh, uh, as well. And we need to to look at how people travel here and how they move about uh, when they are here. And, uh, and and James has given us some great examples of how that can be done in a green way. We need to help our uh, our town centres to evolve. Uh, and we all know that, uh, that the way people shop is is changing and uh, retail is, is moving more online and we need to help that process and we're doing that through things like the uh, Siren Sester uh, Town Centre Master Plan. But of course as a, as a relatively small local authority we can't do all this ourselves so we need to work with others like uh, the G1st LEP, the County Council and because we're such a spread out district uh, town councils and local business groups there on the ground uh, are really important as our eyes and ears and, and the people uh, who can help us to uh, to deliver. I think finally, just promoting the uh, the Cotswold district as a great place to, to do business is really important. I think in the in the past uh, we may have been guilty of of not doing that, perhaps even being a a little bit complacent, but that certainly isn't the case now, and uh, and we're doing what we can uh, to get that word out and hopefully. Uh, people and, uh, and businesses will respond to that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's great. Now, there's a couple of things on the chat. One was from, um, I think it was from, uh, yeah, James Thomas. James, you're from uh, Rose Hill Travel. You, you had a point there. James there still yeah <clears throat> yeah hi there everybody um yeah it was just um regards a question that, that that you um that you raised um of how important it was for the district council to to be involved in this and I just wanted to add that you know if if the council pushes this as much as possible, it'll only encourage other companies to come to the area and set up. So that, that's really what I just wanted to um, to add to the conversation. What, what are your thoughts about what Tony was saying? Do you believe him? In what way? Well, councillors say a lot of things sometimes and they don't deliver on them like governments sometimes do. But I mean, um, these, are, these are big ideas, aren't they? And money uh, is at the center of it. Um, do you? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do believe them. I, I do believe them. I, I don't think um, the Cotswolds or any district council for that matter to the, can afford not to, not to do this. Uh, and I believe his words, you know, the, the agenda has been written. I, I read um, I read the document the other, uh, last week. Um, yeah, the ball is obviously rolling. Yeah, I, I, th I think they will. And I wish them every luck. You know, if we don't do it, we will be, you know, the Cotswolds will be, um, we will be behind everywhere else. The, I, I run a tourism business and already I've seen that the Lake District is looking to be the first carbon neutral county in the country. You know, we need to be up there with the Lake District, um, you know, pushing this forward as well. You, you know, we should be talking with them and, you know, and, and trying to beat them to, to first place if, if we can. Tourism is a major, major industry for us. Um, so, yeah, no, no, I think the, I, I hope the, the council are taking this seriously. I'm sure they are. Yeah, I wish them all the luck with it. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much, uh, James. Rachel, Rachel Johnson, you've got a point as well. Rachel McCall. Hi, you yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I was just commenting that obviously the differences in public and the private sector, and it's quite interesting. Obviously, I work for a neighbouring council, you know, and yes, we're very similar. You know, we want to make change, but it's it's on such a huge scale, and you've got to um, 
take into account lots of policy and red tape and it's very difficult whereas listening to Alex you know as an independent organization you're able to do these things much quicker and implement them across your know, supply chain and with your customers so it's absolutely fantastic that it can happen and I know you know you just posed the question to James <clears throat> about you know do you believe what the councillors are saying and you know I, I totally believe what the council is saying but actually these things take time and getting people on board and getting things signed off it's is in a way a bit of a nightmare <laughs> but um yeah i can see positive things happening and it will be good if sometimes i think the public sector needs to take a more private view on things and i know that is a, a very slow um change that is trying to happen so yeah they were my comments yeah so thank you very much good good point um tony can i just ask you to sort of sum up a little bit um i think now, if I was a business listening to you today, I'd be saying, okay, um, I need to go back, talk to my uh, partners, board, whatever. We need to get going. What's the next step then? Um, I, I think the next steps, Ian, are to actually get the board, the next board meeting, if you have a board or even if you're a, a single person entrepreneur, uh, is to actually sit down at the next meeting you have and say, right, what are the things that we can actually do that make a difference now? Doesn't matter how small they are, but if everyone came back to that with the same attitude, and I will say the same enthusiasm that, that Alex and I have shared in terms of when you can leverage big amounts, make sure you're leveraging them for the right reasons. But if you're small, there is no reason why 5,000 single actions in smaller businesses don't have just as positive an effect. And I'm such an advocate of, of businesses like James's, where there are there are transport groups within the Cotswolds that could completely green their fleets, no problem at all. Um, there are farmers right the way across the Cotswolds who are already changing what they do. It's simple, single actions that can happen sooner, not later. Um, anyone who knows me, uh, and I've been in private sector for far longer than I've been a politician, Ian, it's really about delivery from my point of view. I thoroughly understand what Rachel has said and I can share her frustrations, but believe you me, if one thing that, that got me into politics and is gonna make sure I stay here and have an impact, it's actually showing that the public sector when it's properly motivated, properly resourced with the proper financing actually can make a profound difference. And I am, I'm frankly, I'm just so supportive of every business that's just, logged in this morning and wants to share this agenda all of you please go and tell 10 more people about it see if you can encourage them just to make one extra action that will make our economy better greener more sustainable and we will attract uh, young people we will attract business investment we as an economy will grow uh, and for the benefit of the future uh, i would very much dearly love to beat the lake district to being the first fully green county. I, I suspect I have a lot of persuading of my Gloucestershire County Council colleagues, but it won't stop me trying. Yeah, I mean, that's the uh, that's the goal, which is fantastic. Nina, can I just ask you to say a last word? You're pretty steeped in the whole um, green agenda situation. Um, what did you get out of this morning's meeting? Are you enthused by what Cotswold are trying to do? Yeah, I'm really enthused by the, by what, what you're trying to do. And it's it's good that across the board, all of the neighbouring counties as well, everyone's it's on everyone's remit now to try and to take action. I think um Council Daily sort of hit the nail on the head saying that businesses need to be incentivized to take action. And when they're when they are properly incentivized, um, then great things can happen. And it's been really good to hear from the businesses that I've spoken today because it's hearing what's what's worked for them that's what sparks ideas and people can take that back with them hopefully and put them in the business I certainly will be suggesting some of the things that you've been talking to to some of my colleagues here at Business West so yeah there it's always good to talk and always good to share these ideas great thanks Nina and uh, Alex particularly uh enthusiastic about what you were saying and it just seems to me that with Tony perhaps ourselves and yourselves there may be 
something that we can work together on to communicate what we talked about this morning more widely to businesses large and small in Gloucestershire. And uh, James, thank you for your contribution. Uh, that's an amazing business you've got there. Uh, all we need is uh, uh, vaccinations to work, don't we? So that everyone can race around on uh, electric bikes and whatever. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and also to uh, Ben, to Ben Gilbert. Uh, I think that whole area uh, uh, of battery technology that you talked about and retrofitting is, uh, is going to be so important. And um, Paul, thank you for helping us arrange this. I think what we need to do, Tony, is to uh, see this, as they say in the Chinese, as the first step on the journey. Um, and I think what we have to do is uh, what James has been saying. I mean, we have to actually promote what you're doing. Uh, as, we, as you get companies on board, we need to tell people about it. By doing that, we're going to encourage everyone. So really thank you for all your contributions. Uh, we finished a bit earlier, um, but just Tony, a last word from you. Uh, very easy, very easy, Ian. Um, we have the um, uh, Environmental uh, Action Group actually forming, uh, the company's Environmental Action Group forming. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, which Paul has pulled together from a, a huge spread of businesses, large and small, across the Cotswolds. And uh, one of the things, when they've set up their chair and they've got themselves going, so this is a very much an external partnership uh, a committee that we're trying to set up. One of the first things I really want to get them to do is to see how many businesses they can get to sign up to this green pledge to actually make the first step. You're absolutely right to beginning, Ian. Uh, I would love it if I can see three, four, five, six thousand businesses across the Cotswolds sign up to this green pledge to grow the economy, support young people and save the planet all in one go. My goodness, we'd have a fantastic outcome. Yeah, we'd have our support. I think the idea of having our Cotswold District Council green pledge with yourselves backed by um, Alex and the sort of companies that uh, James and Ben represent would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, Libby, is there anything else? Thank you for managing this today for us. You're welcome, no, there's nothing else from me. And the, this has all been recorded. When will it be on our website, Libby? Um, I'll send it over to you and to Kai as soon as we're done, and then I will leave it. To okay, you. and I encourage everyone to use that. Uh, I don't think anyone has said anything um, slanderous or libelous on it. And uh, I just found that really interesting uh, and I'm really enthusiastic and Tony, I think the council are on a winner here and we need to make you, yes, the first Green District Council. Thank you. <laughs>